This podcast contains sensitive topics and discussions. Listener discretion is advised. A 19-year-old woman is found dead inside a hotel's kitchen freezer. After a controversial police investigation, her loved ones are left with many questions. This is the Kanika Jenkins story. Good morning, Megan. Good morning. Megan, you know this case has been on my list since before we even started a podcast. I have been interested. I actually remember, I don't know if you remember, Megan, but I remember watching the video with you yes. in the office. This is way back in the day when we used to be in, on the same days. You recall? Yes, but uh, seriously, this was probably like what? I don't know how long ago this case was, but we watched the video maybe five, six years ago. Yes. Well, this event happened almost seven years ago. And I believe when we were talking about it, it was just new in the news. So yeah, it it was a long time ago, probably before we became such close best friends. And I remember when we first made and compared our list, this one was on your original list. So yep, it was it was number one. And if you recall, Megan, the reason why I've been putting off covering it is because I thought there would be more answers as time went on. Right. And there just simply hasn't been more answers. So I figured, you know, why not talk about it now? Yeah, let's see if we can come up with those answers. And as we go through this episode, I want you to think about, you know, was this an accident? Was there foul play? We would love to hear your thoughts on this one. But I want to point out that even if Kanika's death was accidental, this case brings up many important issues that we have seen in past cases. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot to learn about these types of cases. Okay, I'm ready. I just want to give a special shout out to Alyssa for her help on the research for today's case. And this one was a pretty tough one to research because we are left with so many unknowns. Our story starts with Kanika, a young woman who was born in Chicago on May 27, 1998. She lived in the district of Longdale, which had a reputation of being a pretty dangerous neighborhood, high rates of poverty, and a high crime rate. And this would be in comparison to neighborhoods that it bordered. At the time of the events we're discussing, Kanika was 19 years old, and she was described by all who knew her as happy, smart, and extremely responsible. In fact, Megan, she was working two jobs and planning to go to nursing school. She had realized that she had a love for caring for people who were ill, and this was after her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2017, and Kanika would become her mother's full-time caretaker, which of course is tough for anyone, but especially a teenager. Absolutely. I think this really showcases the kind of dedicated family girl that Kanika was. But Kanika was also a 19-year-old on the cusp of adulthood, and as much as she cared for her mother, Kanika also loved to go out and have a good time and hang out with her friends. And so was the case on the evening of September 8, 2017. Now, on this particular evening, Kanika told her mother that her friends were taking her bowling into the movies, and this would be to celebrate a new job that she had just gotten. Remember I said she worked two jobs? The most recent job she got was working at a local nursing home, Mm, which she was really excited for because this was the first job that was kind of en route to her career path of being a nurse. Right. And as she often did, Megan, she borrowed her mother's car for the night and left the house around 11 p.m. And of course, reading this as an old lady now, I'm thinking 11 p.m. Oh, my God, that's so late. (laughs) But I'm sure you remember those days where your evening did not start until 10, 11, sometimes midnight. I remember them, but I don't miss them anymore. (laughs) (laughs) And not really a surprise because I was once a 19 year old. Although Kanika told her mother that they were going bowling and to the movies, they, in fact, were headed to a hotel party. Uh, Megan, have you ever gone to a hotel party? Honestly, I don't think that was something we did. Oh, you know what? Like, but like for prom and stuff like that. But other than that, no. Wow. I never knew you were so innocent. Okay. I tried to tell you, Amy. (laughs) So Kanika and her three girlfriends headed to a party on the ninth floor of the Crown Plaza Chicago O'Hare Hotel. Now, her friend Irene was hosting herself a birthday party here in one of the rooms. And this hotel was in Rosemont, Illinois, which was a little less than a half hour from Kanika's home. Kanika and her friends often went to parties like this. And Megan, it sounds like you didn't, but any of my friends who are listening will laugh at this. But I'd have to say that the Crown Plaza is definitely um, 
a bit nicer, let's say, than the hotels that me and my friends would go to. We would go to more what you would call a motel. Yeah. And it was often on the side of a highway. (laughs) It was definitely not the Crown Plaza. Either way, I understand the fun of hotel parties. So security cameras would capture a lot of the events that we will be discussing. For starters, footage shows the group of girls entering the hotel through a side entrance. And this makes sense because if they were teenagers headed to a party, they probably don't want to enter through the main entrance. So Mm -hmm. I don't know if someone opened the door for them or the door was unlocked. But either way, you see the girls walking through the hotel. No one looks inebriated. They just look Mm -hmm. excited, ready to go out for the night. How many girls are we talking about? Uh, There were four at this point. Kanika and three of her girlfriends. Okay. During the party, a lot of the friends would post videos on Facebook Live and Snapchat. And these are really interesting, Megan, and you can check them out on YouTube. Now, I'm not going to ask you to view these videos right now because the main video is over six minutes long and there's not a lot going on for most of it. But in certain parts of the video, you can hear people saying things in the background. And this video will also be posted on our YouTube page. Now, these videos have been scrutinized by web sleuths. In this video, mostly you see one girl who's, you know, singing along to music and smoking a joint in the video and kind of looks like she's fixing her hair. And at some point it pans around the room. And some people say you can see Kanika sitting on the bed. Okay. And I would agree. You take a look, but most people agree this was Kanika. And some people say that you could physically see her and other women's discomfort. There were a lot of reports of men aggressively flirting with the girls at this party, even though they were asked to stop many times. Now, despite their perceived discomfort and unwanted male attention, the friends would stay at the party. In the video, in the background, you could hear someone saying, smile, you don't look like you're having fun. Then you can hear someone else saying at some point, stop. But there's a lot of background noise and a lot of different people speaking, so it's pretty difficult. However, you get a sense for the feel at the party. Okay. Around 1.30, Kanika spoke to her sister and also sent her sister a text. Unfortunately, there are no sources that indicate what the conversation was about or what the text said, but this would be the last documented correspondence that Kanika would have with anyone. The friends would stay at the party till around 3 a.m. As they were leaving, Kanika realized that she had left her phone and her keys back in the hotel room. But Megan, this is where things are not so clear because there are two variations of the story. In one scenario, Kanika's friends leave her in the hallway on the ninth floor and they go back into the room to gather Kanika's belongings. In the other version of the story, the group was already outside when Kanika realized she forgot her items and Kanika herself headed back to go get her phone and her wallet. In either scenario, though, it is clear that Kanika was by herself in the hotel And several security cameras would capture her wandering the hallways alone. Megan, as you could see in the video, Kanika is clearly inebriated. She's walking into walls. She's stumbling over herself. I saw the video and it's very clear. She is extremely intoxicated. She was at that party at that point for what, about two and a half hours? Yep. I'd like to know if anyone reported what Kanika drank, if they knew like what she was drinking, how much, were there any reports of drug use? Did anyone even think someone slipped something in their drinks? Like all of this. Are you going to answer all these questions? Or Yes, absolutely. One, three. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. I promise. Okay. About those videos, though. So the clip that we're looking at is the clip that has been widely circulated. But I want to make clear that there's over 36 hours of video relevant to this case. And not all the video has been released. So the video that you saw shows Kanika in a hallway. At some point, she almost goes over a stair railing. Right. You know, she like bumps into it. Yeah. And then she like kind of stumbles. At that next point, some say that it appears as though someone's pulling her. If you look on like that right side where she kind of goes off frame for a moment, then she kind of comes back. I saw that. A lot of speculation in the video. And then we also see her stumbling around in a kitchen. I noticed that at the end. I was like, wow, she wandered into a kitchen too. Yes. From the footage, it seems very clear that she was probably not in the state to be left alone. Now, I'm not at all placing blame on any of her friends because it's possible that they were equally inebriated and didn't realize. Maybe they didn't think she was in danger or maybe they figured, you know, what would happen in a couple of minutes when either we're going to get her wallet or she's going. 
Either way, as the friends are waiting, they say about a half an hour passed and Kanika never returned. And you could see through other CCT footage that her friends were going through the hotel hallways looking for her. At some point, they even went to the front desk asking if they could please see the security footage of the building so they could look for their friend. Oh, wow. Probably not surprising, Megan, though. The associate at the desk said that they were not allowed to see the footage. Did they alert them, though, at the front desk? Like, hey, we have a friend missing in this hotel. And did the hotel do anything? You know, I want to know, like, what the response is here. Yeah, unfortunately, they asked many employees for help, including a security guard. They were not given the help. And in fact, they were told to just go home. I mean, could this be because there was a bunch of tipsy girls and they're used to this type of scenario? Okay, your friend's probably off somewhere, maybe. Right. You know, she met someone, you know, they're trying to do their job and they don't want to be bothered. But Megan, by 4 a.m., her friends are now getting frantic. And one of the girls called Kanika's mom, Teresa, to let her know that Kanika was missing. At this point, the girls had Kanika's keys and phone, which, of course, would point to the first scenario being true. Remember I said there's two scenarios, either Kanika went to get her stuff or the friends did? Yes. Clearly, if the friends have her belongings, that lends to the first story. Right where they left her alone and they went back to retrieve the items. Okay. So they told Teresa that Kanika had wandered off while they were getting her things from the hotel room. As any mother would be, Teresa was extremely concerned and she headed over to the hotel right away. Teresa asked to see the security footage, but as her friends were told, Teresa was told that she would not be looking at the footage and in fact, she would have to file a missing persons report in order to see the footage. Now, many people fault the hotel, but the hotel has policies. There's privacy and security issues, so I don't think we can necessarily fault the hotel for not letting them see the footage, but perhaps they could have been a little more helpful in helping search for Kanika. Sure. Teresa then called 911 and told the operator about her missing daughter and explained how this was not at all like Kanika and that she was worried for her daughter's safety. Unfortunately, the operator told Teresa that her daughter was probably just with friends or maybe fell asleep somewhere and to just give her a few hours to come home. You know, this is just a response that is not totally uncommon. And most people get upset and blame the operator. And trust me, there are situations where I do too, but there are enough cases where this happens. And it is that instance that it's, you know, it's a difficult task to weigh the, you know, the reality of the situation versus how many of these situations occur. And when you have a missing person, time is of the essence. Every minute is important. So they're losing precious time here. Well, that's the conundrum there, right? It it really is. Mm -hmm. So Teresa asked if she could file a missing persons report because, of course, she wanted to see those videos, but the hotel staff told her she couldn't without a report. Right. She was told by the operator that filing a police report would take a long time, so she should, quote, try and relax and wait a few hours before doing that. Such a crap answer. Sorry. I agree. As we see in a lot of missing person cases, especially with young women, The severity of the situation is not taken seriously. And in a lot of cases, and as we'll see in this case, it leads to a tragic outcome. Right. And Teresa was incredibly frustrated, but she followed the operator's instructions and she just hung out in the hotel lobby, hoping to see if Kanika would turn up. At some point, she walked around the hotel, actually knocking on hotel room doors, asking people if they have seen her daughter. Unfortunately, this prompted the hotel to call the police to report that Teresa was disturbing the guests. You'll be shocked to find out that the police did not get to the hotel until 1 p.m. on September 9th. And this was after Teresa called again, trying to file a missing persons report. And at this point, Megan, Kanika had been missing for almost 10 hours. Oh, her mother must have been so completely frustrated. Frantic, frustrated. Yes, she definitely was. Because she knows her daughter, and this isn't like her daughter. Again, Kanika was known as being a very responsible young woman. When the police arrived at the hotel, they performed a preliminary search, and they didn't find anything. So at that point, they left the premises to look in other places where Kanika may have run off to. I don't know if Teresa gave them names of, you know, close friends, and they looked there, or if they were just looking in the surrounding areas. But over the next 24 hours, while they were searching for Kanika... The police were combing through the hotel security footage because they were trying to piece together what happened. And while all of this was going on, the police received a phone call from one of the hotel's managers. Now, this call was placed around noon on September 10th, about 21 hours after Kanika had gone missing. 
and the manager was placing this phone call to inform the police that he had found a dead body in the hotel's walk-in freezer. Investigators quickly went to the scene where they would find a young woman lying on her side with her head propped against a right wall of a walk-in freezer. Her arms and hands were curled under her chin. One of her shoes was off, and on the bare foot, there was a very large bloody scrape. Behind her body, they found a hair tie, and her hair was matted down to her head. Her shirt had ridden up her torso, and lying in front of the young woman's body was a container of lip gloss. This woman was ID'd as Kanika Jenkins. As the manager showed police the discovery, some say that he didn't look very disturbed. And many people found his behavior alarming and suspicious. But Megan, it's hard to judge a person based on the way they react to a traumatic situation. If I only had a dollar for every time we had to say that. I was going to say, here we go again. So let's focus on more solid evidence or actual evidence that's put in front of us. And Megan, that will not be the only speculation in this case, as this case is riddled with conspiracy theories and finger pointing. Now that the police had a body, of course, they need to determine what happened and why and how Kanika ended up in the freezer. Was this an accident or was foul play involved? The medical examiner did not show up until 3 p.m. Now, this is three hours after Kanika was found. And this is a very long time. Yeah. I don't know if it's because they had other cases they were tending to or what. But we know that because of the time loss, we know that this affects the body temperature, the toxicology reports, and rigor mortis. That's correct. And might I mention... The manager had left the freezer open. Which is also going to have a possibly dramatic effect on the findings from the medical examiner. Yeah, and the medical examiner could not accurately say when Kanika entered the freezer Mm -hmm. or when she died. And this, of course, would become very problematic for the investigation. After examining her at the scene, Kanika was transported around 5 p.m. to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. I can't wait for you to tell me what the autopsy is going to... I'm assuming that she died of like hypothermia or something similar, but you're going to tell us now? I am, Megan, and that is that is correct, except there's some more interesting discoveries that I think we need to discuss. So I don't think you'll be surprised to know that toxicology showed that her blood alcohol content was higher than the legal limit at 0.112. Okay. So we're talking almost double. But in addition to the alcohol, they found a drug in her system called topiramate. Now, topiramate This confuses people because this is not known as a party drug. And I did a lot of research to see if this drug is considered a party drug to see if maybe that's why it was in her system. But it doesn't seem to be. That doesn't mean it's not because I'm not in the party scene. I think I know this already, but what is topiramate used for? So usually it's prescribed to children and adults that suffer from epilepsy. So it's used to prevent seizures from happening, but it's also used to treat migraines. Mm. Now, I, I want to say this is strange given that Kanika did not have epilepsy or any history of seizures and she was never prescribed medication for migraines. But this could also be as innocent as a friend of hers was or someone else was and she had a headache and said, hey, take this or someone gives her this and it's she thinks it's something else. So many possible yep. explanations here. Or it could have been that she was taking this medication for headaches and it was just not in her medical records and, uh, you know. A friend took it for migraines that, you know, so it could be innocent. Maybe she was taking it as a party drug. Maybe she was slipped it. It is known, however, that drinking along with this medication can have serious side effects. So as with a lot of medication, it heightens the effects of alcohol. So this could be possibly why she appeared to be so inebriated in the security footage. Now, most of her friends report that she only had one drink. And I don't know if that's just them trying to cover for her or maybe they don't know how much she drank or maybe she did, in fact, only have one drink and the medication heightened the effects that much. Amy, do we know was Kanika, I know she's a a normal 20 year old girl, Mm -hmm. but was drinking a regular part of her because this is also a thing. If she was someone who didn't drink, Mm -hmm. you know, then there might be different effects of alcohol on her. So I just assume she was one of those social drinkers. I don't know for sure how much she normally drank, but I do not get the impression that she was a heavy drinker. Right. Recall that she was planning to go to nursing school. Yes. So many people say not only was she not a heavy drinker, but it's very unlikely that she would have, number one, drank alcohol on a medication. 
Number two, taking a pill as a party drug. Yes. So a lot of people question this. Okay. Now, her friend Irene, and this is the friend whose birthday party it was, she stated that some people at the party occasionally took pills and they used party drugs. But all the witnesses who were interviewed said that Kanika hated drugs and would not have taken anything. But again, could they be trying to protect themselves? So it's really hard to know. So this would lead many people to the theory that, you know, was Kanika drugged? I also wonder if someone was planning on drugging Kanika, why use this medication? It would be a very bizarre medication to use for that purpose, I would think. Unless it's all they had at their disposal and maybe they knew that it would heighten the effects and it would maybe be enough to, you know, make Kanika appear more drunk. I don't know. Possibly. How did the medical examiner rule in terms of her death? Was it accidental, undetermined, or homicide? The ME ruled her death accidental with Mm -hmm. cause of death as hypothermia from the freezer. Yeah. But also mentioned the alcohol and the topiramate in her system, which could have interacted with each other. Okay. So the police cleared everyone at the party as suspects. So to the police, this case was closed. Kanika's funeral was held shortly after, and it drew hundreds of attendees. And many people didn't even know Kanika at all. Now, I think it's because this story made local and I would say even national headlines because of the bizarre nature in which Kanika was found. Also, very quickly, all of those CCT videos were released to the media. And you can see Kanika and her state. You know, like I said, there was lots of speculation on different theories. That's where I'd like the conversation to go now. Because I'll tell you that Kanika's family and friends, they did not think that this death was accidental. Okay. And they weren't the only ones. As I mentioned, there were web sleuths that started looking into this case. Well, I'm ready for the theories, Amy. I've been thinking this for a while. You're, <laughs> I, I assume you're going to cover all of them now. Yeah, let's go through them one by one. Can't wait. Theory one, Kanika was drugged at the party, possibly sexually assaulted, and then murdered. Now, supporters of this theory point to what seems to happen in the Facebook Live video. So in the video, some people say if you slow it down and cut out some of the background noise, you can hear Kanika saying, quote, girl, I am not drunk. But obviously she was pretty inebriated. Right after this, it sounded like someone may have said to Kanika, well, just enjoy yourself, Kanika, to which she replied, I am enjoying myself. And then what got most people's attention was when you hear someone possibly saying, quote, they stupid, they in there raping that girl. Oh. Other people who watch this video and slow it down say you that this isn't necessarily what the comment says. So, you know, I don't know how much weight we could put into this theory. But, you know, like I said, the video's out there. You can go see for yourself. You know what? There could be video forensics on this done as well. I mean, I understand we can all interpret things differently, but There's a way to do this, you know, Mm -hmm. to discern the video to uh, sorry, discern the audio in the video. There's definitely audio uh, specialists who could, I would think, do that. I I wonder if the police have employed that tactic. I would hope they did. I watch these Facebook live videos and it does kind of sound like you can hear a girl in the background talking to a guy and you get the feeling that she's uncomfortable. You can kind of hear someone say something that sounds like lay down. And you kind of hear something that could sound like help me or like a distress squeal. But again, this could be also like confirmation bias. Yeah. Where, you know, you think something nefarious happened. So you're hearing things through a different lens. So Mm -hmm. I I really, I don't want to speculate any further on this. But, you know, the music is very loud. After this conversation, the music gets very loud. And you can hear any conversation after that. So this would also bring up the burning question. Did the medical examiner find any evidence of sexual assault? It was not reported that they did. I would hope that a rape kit was performed in this situation when you find a woman dead in mysterious circumstances. But Mm -hmm. I can't be 100 percent certain on that. Okay. so all of this is circumstantial and very subjective. But I think the video's do hint at possibilities that there were some dangerous behaviors going down at this party and potentially could have led to something happening to Kanika. It also could be that there were dangerous things going down at this party that have nothing to do with Kanika, and they're just independent of each other. I agree. So what about the people at the party? As we, I just said something, you know, dangerous could be going down at this party. Is there a list of the people who were there? Have they been interviewed? Are, are those interviews public? What do we know? That's a good question because most people at the party have chosen to remain quiet. There have been some videos that 
circulated of people talking about what happened at the party. Then they have been taken down. Some people were being harassed. So it didn't become a good situation because everyone was kind of pointing fingers at everyone else. And then at some point. But do we know if the police interviewed them? Like, did they interview all that? I have to assume that they did. Even if uh, the participants aren't speaking publicly, that's one thing. But Mm -hmm. I'm hoping there was at least like a comprehensive list of, you know, Mm -hmm. people who attended and interviews with them. I don't know to what degree the police investigated, but it was reported that everyone who was at the party was cleared. Okay. Okay, let's go into theory two. Okay. Some people say that the security footage was tampered with. If you notice, there were cameras in the kitchen, right? The cameras that faced the freezer were mysteriously not working that day, but yet all the other cameras in the kitchen were working. So the video that you saw, it does not show anyone going into the freezer. Mm Mm-hmm. The reason why this comes up is because Teresa was told that there were no cameras that pointed to the freezer. However, she says that when she was there, she said that she clearly saw cameras that faced the freezer. So she believed that someone was lying. And why would someone lie about this? That's interesting. Again, these web sleuths, if you look at the video, it almost looks as if there's like an invisible person holding up Kanika. You know, at some point, like she like goes all the way back and then forward or she stumbles like. This this seems a little outrageous, but some people speculate that there was someone else actually in the video with her and someone doctored the video to take out someone. Now, if you watch these videos with that in mind, you can kind of see it. But again, well, again, could now be... you just told me it's in my <laughs> mind, so I probably will think that. But had you not, I wonder if I would have thought that. That seems like that would have to be someone pretty advanced in doctoring. Yeah. And I'm going to say that if this was a crime, it was not a premeditated one. And mm-hmm. that would be some coincidence yeah. to have someone involved who could doctor a video to that extreme. So I'm going to say that's probably not the case. But if you remember all those years ago when we were watching the video in our office, the reason I was watching it is because I had read this conspiracy theory about, you know, right. is there someone who is removed from this video? Right. And if you look at it through that lens, you can really see it. Okay. Right. But an expert analyzed the files that were sent to the police, saying that the files would not have been able to be downloaded and viewed if they had been tampered with. So the probability of the footage having been deleted or edited is pretty low. Okay. But the reason I bring it up is because it is one of the prevailing theories out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Theory three. Kanika was dragged into the freezer and murdered. I'm sorry. In the freezer? Yes. I don't know about that. Yeah. Well, let's hear why. Okay. Yeah, let's hear the circumstantial evidence that goes along with this. Okay. So recall one of her shoes was off when they found her. Mm-hmm. And some say that this would happen by someone dragging her into the freezer. Now, the freezer door was very heavy. So people wondered if she would be able to open it herself, mm-hmm. especially in the state she was in. Would she have the coordination and the strength to open the freezer? What's more concerning to me is the fact that when she was found in the freezer, the door was closed. I've heard about people getting locked in freezers, actually. So that's I don't know about this particular freezer. But what do we know about the freezer? Are there any safety measures on this freezer to prevent from someone getting locked in? You know, that's a good question. And I'm not sure. But many point to the fact that she was so inebriated that if she did, in fact, figure a way in, it's very unlikely she would be able to figure out a safe, you know, like a safety latch because usually they're not so straightforward. I mean, I don't know. This is all speculation. We don't have the freezer in front of us. It's really hard to say, but something. So hold on. I also want to say that I don't think it's impossible for someone, even if she was inebriated, to open a freezer door like that. I've opened plenty of them mm-hmm. <laughs> in, in restaurant work. And granted, I wasn't inebriated when I was working, but I could easily have seen me having a couple of drinks and being able to get that door open. Yeah. Especially knowing me thinking <laughs> there's some food in here or something like that. You know, uh, I don't discount that possibility. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't say that's the most reliable theory. Yeah. Maybe in her inebriated state, she was looking for a door, thinking maybe it led to the outside, and then it slammed shut behind her, and she couldn't figure out how to get out. Yeah, who knows? I don't know, but the part that troubles me is that management said the freezer was not working because this kitchen was not currently in use in the hotel. That looked like it on the video, so I recognized that it was a kitchen, but I'm like, that's the barest kitchen I've ever seen. Yeah, so this gets a little strange because if the kitchen isn't being used and the management said that the freezer was, in fact, not being used or working, 
you know, why was the freezer plugged in and less than one degree when she was found? No, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make even if the kitchen's not being used, the freezer was clearly working. The, yeah, that's for sure. The I mean, she was died working. of hyperthermia, so we know that. Yes. I don't know why the manager, you know, but said that. Or I think the this is insinuating that somebody put her in there and then turned the freezer on. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, I see what you're saying. Gotcha. I did not understand that when you first explained it. Yeah, she did have minor injuries, such as this the cut on her foot, and I think there was one slight contusion on one of her thighs, but. There was no blunt force trauma. There wasn't any signs of an altercation. No, and she was stumbling and she probably fell. I mean, I don't think the shoe off is that odd if she was in no. these shoes and she fell or something. That's not strange. So if, if she was laying in that freezer for as, as long as it seems like she was, I think her hair being matted makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some scientific ways to explain some of what was found at the scene that could point to accidental death. I mean, the state of Kanika's clothing could point to paradoxal undressing. And this is the phenomenon where people who are suffering from hypothermia start to remove their clothing hysterically. Maybe this is why her shoe was off and this is why her shirt was pulled up a little. I have to tell you, interestingly, James and I were just discussing this the other day. Why? Um, because we were discussing deaths from hypothermia and he was explaining some of the, the things that happen to your body when you you know, go into hypothermia and how you really become in a state of, you know, kind of almost like delusional yep. and you don't know what's going on and you may even take off your clothes. I had never heard of yeah. it until maybe two days ago. If you think about it, if she, because of the drugs in her system and the alcohol, maybe she started removing her clothes and then maybe she passed out. Yeah. Um, or maybe the hypothermia led her to pass out before she was able to finish removing her clothes. Mm -hmm. If we're going down the route of accidental, it also is possible that the mixture of the alcohol and the drug disoriented her to such a degree that she was just stumbling through the hallways and wandered into the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And it's possible that the freezer door had been open or whether it was open or closed, you know, she could have tripped over it, sure. which pulled off her shoe and then scraped her foot. And then she maybe passed out and then while she was passed out, unfortunately, succumbed to hypothermia. Sure. Um, are there more theories? <laughs> the last theory, Megan, okay. is that Kanika had died elsewhere in the building and the hotel tried to cover it up. So this goes along with what I was just telling you about the freezer not being in working condition and the freezer being plugged in when they found her. This seems to me that there's not much here. People point to the strange demeanor of the manager. Again, we already shot that down. You know, the police didn't find anything to corroborate the theory that or someone who worked in the hotel did something to her. I mean, the hotel covering it up, you'd have to believe that a lot of people went through some lengths to cover up this crime for maybe someone they don't know. And, you know, there could be people who are highly invested in this hotel. But, you know, can't, you can't believe everyone would. I don't mm -hmm. believe that that many people would go along with that yeah. kind of conspiracy. And from what I heard, I don't fault the hotel because, again, businesses have privacy rules and security rules. And you can't just go sharing CCTV footage with anyone who asked for it. I mean, while they could have provided maybe more assistance in searching with the family, I definitely don't fault them for holding on to those tapes. Yeah, you have to realize, too, that could be someone stalking another person and trying to use that kind of footage yes, to find exactly. them. So there is reason for that, although I think they could have been more helpful. Now, Kanika's family states that she could have been saved if the hotel staff had not refused to help them in their search. But I think more importantly, if the Chicago Police Department right. took this more seriously and got on scene faster. Right. Again, they did not come to the scene until 10 hours after Kanika's original disappearance. That's way too long. And I think it's very feasible to say that if they responded quicker, Kanika could have possibly been found, treated and saved. I think that's totally feasible. In 2018, Kanika's family filed a lawsuit against the Crown Plaza Hotel for $50 million, stating that the hotel employees were at fault for not helping Kanika's friends or Teresa by letting them see the footage or at the very least helping them search the hotel. Now, again, her death was ruled accidental and it remains that way and her case is closed. There was a petition on change.org to get it reopened in 2019, but nothing came of that. Mm -hmm. And also that civil suit is still pending. I'd like to think they'd reopen it and the medical examiner would be open to changing the finding if new evidence surfaced. But there are a lot of avenues to be pursued and there could be a lot of you know possibilities 
ruled out, I think, through a thorough investigation here. Yeah. And I think the biggest issue, again, is the police response. And we can't ignore the fact that Rosemont, where the hotel was, Mm -hmm. their black population is only 3%, which, of course, would lead many people to believe that racism could have played a part in how investigators handled Kanika's case and the way in which the police did not take the friends and families calls for help seriously. Right. And we don't know if race played a part. We don't know if the response would have been any different if Kanika was not a minority. But I think it's important to recognize that because this is not the first and certainly not the last. Unfortunately, this is probably not going to be the last case in which these types of claims are brought up. Yeah, I would also say I understand the possible role of race. It's definitely a possibility, but also... We've talked about these cases with just young women in general. When they go missing, there's a tendency to dismiss them, independent, I would say, of racial identity. Yep. There's been like a tendency for them to go, oh, well, she probably just ran off. She's probably with her friends. She's probably with a boyfriend. So, you know. And I think we also see, and especially in cases of women of color, particularly, where police are quick to assume a death was accidental without maybe investigating as thoroughly as they should. I couldn't help but think of Tamla Horsford's case. This was very similar in the sense that she was found with alcohol in her system and they were quick to say that she fell from a balcony because she had drank so much. But if you look closer into the case, it seems as though the investigation, there were a lot of issues with the investigation in that case. And there's a lot of parallels here. Sure. And then, of course, this case is also similar to Phoebe Lavina's Ellen's, where you have a case of a woman who, whether or not the death was accidental, was it murder, was it death by suicide? It's not entirely clear, and it's because of the way the case was investigated or not investigated correctly. Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. So, Megan, you know, did the system get it right here? I'm not sure. Do you have an opinion here? Well, it's too soon to tell. Did the system work right? So we usually do like the end. Like, did the system get it right? Um, actually, that that's not entirely true, but we're talking about there's different steps of the system. So... You know, the processing, the examination, the investigation. So you're talking about, you know, beginning with the police and the response. So I'd say the response, no, wasn't wasn't entirely correct at all. And I hope that maybe, you know, this is one of those cases where I hope there's so much more going on behind the scenes that we don't know about and that the police are just keeping quiet on it, but that they are doing, you know, the best that they can. Mm -hmm. I know it was ruled an accident, but because of such questionable circumstances, I really hope they haven't dismissed this one and just, you know, cast cast it off completely, because I do think there are unanswered questions here. And I agree. And if the if Kanika's death was, in fact, accidental, I think Kanika's family at least deserves to know that all other avenues were pursued and they need to know that this was unfortunate. And maybe also, you know, we can learn from this. How can this be prevented in the future? Sure. How can this be prevented in the future? How can it be solved quicker? How Mm -hmm. do we give the families that comfort? How do we balance, you know, the needs of, you know, law enforcement as well with the needs of the family and the needs of general society? You were right in that this case may not be solved. It may even be an accident. And I think that's entirely possible. But there's so many other lessons to be learned from this case in itself that I'm really glad you covered it. And if we hear about any case updates, we will be sure to share it with our listeners. Absolutely. I'll be I'll be looking at this one myself now, Amy. You've brought yet another curious case to us. Thank you for that. All right. Well, thank you all so much for listening today. And we'll catch you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer is James Varga, edited by Jose Alfonso. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content such as virtual happy hours and an extra full-length episode each month. For more information, visit patreon.com slash womenincrime. Sources for today's episode include Ebony Magazine, Newsweek, ABC7, Essence Magazine, The Chicago Tribune, CrimeWire, and The Mayo Clinic.